Better, better you should smoke Avenue pot than buy all those records. And would you please stop playing with matches? Can you guess where we are? We're in Moscow <laughs> for the first annual uh, Putin bashing awards <laughs> they're giving out. I don't know what they know about that. I snuck into the country and when, when it's over, I will try to sneak out. But if you don't see me again, you'll know where I, what happened. No, we're actually in uh, Amsterdam. He was quite a boring man, and his name was Adolf Leonard van Gent. He was a friend of Kuipers, and who the bloody hell is Kuipers? But Kuipers is the one who found, who uh, uh, constructed the Rijksmuseum and Central Station, among the other buildings. Kuipers was actually uh, very willing to design this building, but he was not allowed to because there was already too much Kuipers things in the city and need to be someone else, so it became his friend and colleague Adolf Leonard van Gent, who won the contest because Kuipers was in the commission to judge the contest and he saw, oh, this is the design from van Gent, the winner, we open it, and they, he showed it to the people and he said, Okay, Mr. Van Gent, change this because it's not good. That was a, a camera system installed in 18 what? Yeah, in 18, uh, 18, 1893. Yeah, that's what it looks like. <laughs> uh, the monitors are later days. Yeah. Um, so here are the tuning rooms for every musical group, a separated room for their instruments to be put there in the intermission. Uh, and you can argue, well, why do you need that? Because yeah, you can also be in one room, like it was in the old days. It was a big mess, but uh, and, and nobody liked it. It had to be separated. Because violins don't like brass players, they're too noisy. And the woodwinds are busy with their reeds all the time and they don't want to be disturbed by someone else. And you have to have separated rooms. Now, we have them since 1988. Um, this is a door that leads to the lifts for transporting of pianos directly on stage. We can go there, but we have to be very silent because the rehearsal is over your head. So is the music. Yeah. I don't hear anything. It's very silent. double bases in one go upstairs. In the old days you had to put them upstairs. Okay, this is your selfie moment. You can make your, your own picture in the piano. Okay. Steinways, Hamburg. This is the older one and that is only two weeks old. Now a month. Because that one's the new one. There are two so that the instrumentalist can choose between them. So they go both on stage and on stage they can decide which one they want to use for their concert. And after that choice, the piano technician will talk with the pianist in order to prepare it for his, to his wishes. And this was a um, half basement in which, the long one, there was the cloakroom situated for the people. And, uh, and, and they had to, the people had to go down the staircase, which is of course problematic because you have to climb it up again. You may get tired from that, so people didn't use this. Very much. We notice that the rehearsal is finished because you can see that on the monitor. And the only thing they regulate here is the ventilation of the hall and the light settings on the stage and in the hall. 
There is nothing to do with sound here. The only sound that we can regulate here during a concert is only when there is an announcement done by someone who's speaking through a microphone and then upst upstairs is someone with a tablet arranging the sound and that's it. And you see a special feature that's the big curtain. The big curtain is there to mimic 2,000 people in the hall and that curtain is there for 2,000 people hanging. Once there was a, a student from Finland who, uh, who made studies on acoustics and he wanted to judge the acoustics on stages in different halls in Europe and then he noticed very proudly the stage at Concertgebouw has not that good acoustics and that's what we said yes exactly because we have the good acoustics for the people not for the musicians. The clock here is open just for the rehearsals, so everyone knows this is done. The names on the wall, there, now, there, that's the thing that's going to The curtain goes down now, now you have the view of the TV. Names on the wall, just to show the honors of the proposals. The reason for us to be built. The beauty of this hall, and I'm working here since 1991, and I'm still marveling about this whole thing every day when I'm here. And you can see what I mean with dipping in the stage. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is it. <laughs> you can see from, from there. Royal Keys, number 64. more surround. Yeah. But it doesn't matter if you sit at the side or in the center. Right. And we as ushers, we have to take place in the hall during a concert to overview the masses, you know, that they behave themselves. And if they don't, they can kick them out. No. That's Many halls have this acoustics in their wish list. If they build a concert, then they want to be able to mimic this one. Boston Symphony Hall is constructed after studies of this one. They went to Leipzig to see that hall, and then they noticed, oh, the stage is way too small. I think they built another one in Amsterdam based on this one. Let's see that one. He came, they came here, they saw this, and they said, okay. Mm -hmm. And then in Boston, you have that hall, and, and it looks in atmosphere a bit more like it, like this, than then Leipzig. So Leipzig is uh, completely not looks there. Yeah. Yeah.
the price getting bigger. <laughs> But for me, it's just like 15 years. Because I've been very lucky uh, to be part of a very interesting project in, uh, so many times. But I haven't spoken how I entered to Marant, how it started. And then early period, what I was doing. So today, I'm going to tell you how it started, and how I went into the Moran's organization, and what was my feeling about Moran's in that time. Then. It was 1977, not 78. So 41 years ago, Moran's Europe, which was based in Brussels in that time, they contacted me. And then I went there. And they said, well, we would like to have you hmm, because we have hmm, relationship with the Japanese manufacturer. But we don't have anybody who speaks Japanese and understand the business and also hmm, engineering. We need such a person then someone must have recommended me to them. So I said, yeah, that's fine. So I gave my condition, everything to Marantio, personal manager. She looked at me, and then my paper indicated what I want for the income. Mr. Ishiwata, sorry. We can afford you. <laughs> <laughs> that was her answer. I said, uh uh uh. I'm not going to bargain myself. No way. So I left. I completely forgot about it. A few months later, early 1978, they called me back. We can't afford you, but our Japanese organization, they still want you. <laughs> they will pay <laughs> the amount you want. So that's okay. So let's talk. So I went there and met Japanese gentleman. And then discussed everything. And the same it went okay. And they said, we will talk in Japan and come back to you. I said, okay, no problem. They came back in one week. Okay, you were hired. That's what they said. <laughs> but now you have to come to Japan for three months hmm, for training. I said, okay, no problem. Hmm, I'll be there. And they sent me the ticket. So went off. But my idea about Morant, of course, I knew so be Morant's product. Because in high school time, I encountered Model 7, Model 9. Uh, I was so impressed. But then I knew they've been sold. And Superscope bought it. But Superscope had it. Exactly. And then they went to Japan. And they made this Marantz Japan Inc., which was former standard radio. Does anybody know what the standard radio was? They had two things. One was for radio communication unit, for yeah, amateur, yeah, for the uh, 3.5 meg and 7 meg uh, communication. Yeah, so that was the equipment they were producing. And 60% of their business was similar to Sony, like portable radio and so on. So, in my feeling, they don't know anything about the hi-fi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So but now <coughs> they become a part of big Marantz brand. So I was wondering so what it was. No, so I went I went to Japan and then uh, on the first two weeks I had to be in the engineering group for the amplifier and the receiver. For me, it was quite shocking discovering Superscope standard there. It was amazingly high standard, which for normal Japanese, because the my time, I came from Pioneer originally. And then, see, in that time, Pioneer came with Sansui. Yeah? Those are the three most important hi fi brands. Compared to those three Japanese brands, Superscope set it up, but incredible standard. They were following IHF standard in that time, of course, <coughs> for the measurement, but they did control every production and followed AQL, American Military Quality Control System, AQL, and not just only for the first production, for every production. And then when they ship those products to the United States and also to Europe, they did the incoming inspection in America and the incoming inspection in Europe. And they were following AQL standard on the highest possible way. I was really impressed how they did. And then they told me another standard we have. We have so-called true power condition. What do you mean with the true power set? They said on every amplification we make, receiver or amplifier, minimum at 4 ohm had to deliver 25% more than 8 ohm. Yeah for 100% product, production, everything. And amplifier, receiver, you have so many parameters, amplifier <coughs> power, distortion, <coughs> signal to noise, everything. All those <laughs> announced specification is usually champion specification, isn't it? From the, all those Japanese companies. Superscope, they said, our standard, huh? we check every unit, like we do it in quality. 75% must fulfill all parameters. For the announced specification, not in-house specification. I was really shocked. And they were actually controlling all those details, huh? when they are producing the product, and when they ship it to the Europe and to America, local quality control. What I understood was then, when European do this incoming control, we have always too high reject. The basic reason why we hired you, we want you huh, to find it out what is going <coughs> Especially with the, these receiver and amplifier, huh, they have a lot of problems. Huh. So I said, okay. And then I was really su surprised how they set it up such a high standard for the specification. But it was, for me, biggest support, that's the difference between Marantz and the rest. It is not the same as other Japanese company. But then, when I started to work on their product, I was really shocked. Like, when they were developing amplifier standards they have, they feed tone burst signal on the power amp. They bring it in the clipping level. Yeah. And then uh, 
they increase it. 6 dB. Yeah? Creeping it. Eh? From then they increase 6 dB. And then they keep running for three days. Yeah. And amplifier, amplifier may not break. That's the standard they set it up. And this load was not resistive load. They had uh, plus minus 60 degree phase shift, mm -hmm. 30 hertz. It's a crazy test. Not one Japanese company are doing such a test. And that was the quality of the standard. They were having it in the balance. I was so shocked. I said, wow. Huh? It's a quite a different thing. So I asked them, hmm, how did you start it with standard radio? Because you guys, they, uh, you didn't have any knowledge or even experience on those highway. But yes, we had to get American engineers, educators, and then they thought from the beginning in the past five years, Japanese were not allowed to design anything. They were just studying Maran's way of designing amplifier. Do you know some of you, maybe you know, Mr. Like, uh, Mr. Bongiorno, yeah, who was the fantastic yeah. amplifier designer? Yeah. 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 He, he was part of the Super Scope. And yeah, he set it up all those uh, quality standards together with Mr. Goldberg yeah, of the quality control. Mm -hmm. And they, they set it a really high standard. But I was really surprised. Like it did in, you know, FM, how they have set it up. Yeah. Sensitivity, yeah, also distortion, and how you measure it was a very precise. And then on the quality control, how has to be done? I learned so much from them, hmm? how they did all those incredible tests for the quality. So they were so keen on keeping quality high. So that was my first education when I went into Morant. Uh, and then I was very happy uh, to be in such an organization. Then of course, first two weeks, amplifier and receiver. Then followed by tape recorder, cassette deck in that time. Because they had their own mechanism, cassette deck, producing it, mechanism themselves, and then making cassette deck as well. They, mm -hmm. they also had a very specific way of designing uh, cassette deck and also the way of measuring. For example, on the one and flutter, maybe most probably you know, Japanese GIS measurement on one and flutter is completely different to the CCIR, where uh, with the uh, CCIR <coughs> are much more sensitive. So uh, they had a big discrepancy, but they really followed CCIR, all Japanese are following GIS. Yeah. That was uh, another you know, surprise factors I had. Yeah. And also the mechanism they were doing, it was very interesting. But then I discovered, maybe I told you, yeah, the time of the pioneer, I did the open deal. Yeah. So I knew how the test tape transport was. And then back tension, so supply relief tension yeah, to keep tape against the head, it's so damn important. In their facet mechanism, this was weak. Yeah. So I pointed out, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, you have all those w wonderful standards, yeah, but yeah, what we can do to increase back tension yeah, in such a way. And you know, I enjoyed the second week working on a, such a product 
directly. But it was again a uh, very professional way of creating product and the designing mechanism and the electronics in parallel. It was really a wonderful experience. Yeah. So I spent uh, three months learning about Murans yeah, and then went back to Europe. I have to drink something, otherwise my throat. <laughs> Then I went into the, this factory in Belgium. Morant had a factory in Belgium for the speakers. That where they did incoming inspection as well. And then I saw how that this incoming inspection is done. And they do every day yeah, because so many yeah, they have to do the sampling based on equal standard. And so they have to test all the parameters. It's a lot of work. So every day from in the morning till evening they are doing this thing. And they are rejecting. So I had to sit on this bench of a testing. Rejected one, I tested. Yeah. Ninety percent but within the specification of Japan. What I found it out was the way measuring huh, specification was wrong. Well, not wrong, but they didn't know. Uh, for example, when they are testing FM, you have signal straight meter. Yeah? Then you tune it in the maximum. Then for fine tune, you have yeah, center tuning meter and then yeah, they, what they do, they bring it to the center. But as you know, unfortunately, those IF circuit is not symmetrical. Yeah? So if you place tuning to the center, you won't get always the lowest distortion. Yeah? But of course, those people who are sitting in the production uh, or the, this the quality control line, uh, they do not have those knowledge. So they were just adjusting to the center and then distortion figures are too high. So they rejected. So in such a way, uh, I discovered how those uh, miscommunication between Europe and Japan happened. Same is the power measurement, yeah, how they have been doing it in the power measurement. Yeah. All those things, yeah. so fast, one year, I was sitting in this quality control line every day and then checking all rejected unit, report back to Japan and then explain those errors made by the people who test them. You know? And then all of a sudden communication with Japan become much, much better. So they were quite happy with what I started to do. So that was my first job, you know, to do solving the problem of misunderstanding, I would say, between Japanese engineering group and European quality department. And they were doubting each other. That was their problem. It was not product issue at all. And I was quite happy working <coughs> in such a because I learned so much by doing this thing. That was my first experience with Morant. And I enjoy it very much because by doing this, yeah, you learn so much. And as I said, on this place was a speaker factory. And as you know, in Europe, they prefer European sounding speakers. Yeah? Morant, they had only American design, American sounding speakers. 
And they were looking for European design. Yeah? And then they found it out, I was involved in the time of the pioneer, communicating with Japan, with the European requirement for the speakers. And I did help Japanese engineering group on the speakers. So I did some development with them. <coughs> Anybody remember in that time? Pioneer speaker system called CSE700. Special tweeter on top. This is no, it was a sectoral home. Last mm -hmm. you know, That was the afterward. Okay. Yeah. Oh. It was a oh. generation oh. before. Okay. Yeah. And then this speaker, I did the help yeah, for the Japanese. So, yeah, people in Morant Europe, they found it out what I was doing. So, can you do the speaker development for us? Mm -hmm. So, on top of this quality mm -hmm. things, then I started to do the European speaker development. So that uh, the mm. first time mm. I started to involve myself in the month's product directly developing it. What year was this, Ken? Ah, uh, so, so 79. Yeah. See, so then I made uh, quite a number of speakers for them. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like LD50 and uh, that was at the uh, time. Actually, in that time, Marantz Europe was producing between 160 to 260,000 speakers a year. Wow. Mm. Can you imagine that? Under Marantz brand, mm -hmm. and they were selling them. Yeah. They're made in Belgium. Yes. So all the, uh, everything is transducers uh, we developed together with the Japanese, yeah. but manufacturing uh, was done in Belgium. Uh, speaker cabinet was also in, made in Belgium. Right. Yeah. Well, near the French border, there's a nice uh, factory they had, and we could get uh, quite a good speaker cabinet from them, and reasonable price yeah, and good quality. Was it the time of, of Imperial? No, Imperial was American. Yeah, because the that blue, was the blue problem. Codes, the yeah. Blue codes. yeah, that was the time. You see, uh, Fodor uh, in this country was doing it. But then problem was they were all considered it's America, mm. not European. So that was the problem. Then, see, we started to do uh, different yeah, European speakers. Oh, good period, I would say, because in that time, uh, Marantz had a very strong position. It was before Philips. We had really strong position within Europe, high market share everywhere. So I started to do the speakers, and then I started to listen to all the speakers. Then I noticed sound of amplifier was not really what I remember Moran's amplifier sound, <laughs> like Model 7 and Model 9. See? So then I started to communicate with Japan, and going into yeah, details of those yeah, design and so on. So that's the way yeah, I started to involve myself right into the product. See? Then Philip said, yeah, mm. because compact disc came in in the early 80s. And that changed our life completely, including mine. Mm. As you know, compact disc was revolution in a way <laughs> in the, our industry. But majority of audiophile, they didn't like compact disc. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we all knew specification of the compact disc standard I'm talking about. was not really good enough for high level. But 
What we had to think was, you know, this is coming from Philips and Sony. We had to set the standard, uh, which this standard allows such a big company to be able to come up with product uh, within a few years, very reasonable price. Yeah? Because if you set too high, yeah? imagine like a 192K, yeah? a 24 bit in that time, no way. You see? <coughs> Not even 60. <laughs> so the, the, so that's the reason why they set it up, yeah? Yeah? such a standard. Yeah? For Mr. Average, it was good enough mm -hmm. specification. And that's the way yeah, it was defined. Yeah. And of course, we didn't know anything, including myself. I didn't know anything about digital audio at all. I learned so much from Philips. Such a way, yeah, I always gained knowledge from doing something and that's already made such a big difference in my life uh, that's also the reason why this 40 years i don't feel it's so long uh, it's always something new something interesting uh, because as you know when man's japan uh, had to deal with people from philips all japanese engineers they didn't know English at all. So, how are we yeah, going to communicate? Me? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for, for, for them, it's also it was a quite easy solution. Yeah. But for me, it was just knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Yeah. Learned so much by doing these things. Yeah. And then, also, that was the period. So, we learned. He called me. That was the time when, do you know, he tried to come up with a product called Lineage. Yeah? And they could not finish that project because of the fact actual electronics design was done by John Kao. Cosmetic design was done by Sobi Murat. You asked those two to come up with a pre-amplifier and a power amplifier. Yeah. Yeah, they can come with wonderful concept, wonderful design. <coughs> but one commercial guy in this, uh, he set the standard preamp must go out at $1,500, power amp at $2,000. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> You don't ask John Carl or so yeah, designing something for those price points. So John Carl and so did the design. Then they costed calculation more than double. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, holy shit, what are we going to do? And then they contacted Eindhoven, me. Now we got this design. We have to reduce the cost by half. <laughs> Can you help us? <laughs> that was the, my first contact with solving rats. <laughs> no. Anyway, this project no, didn't happen. No. But Saul said, Can, with the tube, and the mono LP, stereo LP, I have done almost everything. But uh, now it's your turn to do something with the CD. I said, well, that's not fair, I said. <laughs> but I said, okay, I'll try my utmost. But in a way, now, again, now, if you ask, reputation of Morantz today. A lot of people think Morantz is a CD specialist, isn't it? <laughs> Not just an amplifier. So I think it's, in a way, 
came out that way as well. So such a way, you know, I had my life starting with Murant, yeah, coming from pioneer background and completely different. And then I was able to experience uh, so many wonderful things yeah, with Murant, learning <coughs> about everything. And that what Murant gave to me. Yeah. And I, of course, tried in my own way yeah, to give it back yeah, as much as I personally could do. And yes, 40 years, it's a long, long time. But no, it's a wonderful time, I have to say. I really enjoyed so much with this period. So no, I have no regrets whatsoever. No. And you know no, from the time how no, CD started, then yeah, KI Signature CD, etc., etc. Et those. No. So you all know what happened afterward with my life with Murant. Yeah, but I haven't talked about how I went into the Murant and how I learned so much yeah, from the Murant product. So today, on this occasion, I wanted you all to know huh, how I started with Murant. Yeah, I hope it was interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yes. very much. Yeah. See, as I said, in this story, I wasn't talking to anybody before. So yeah, and hopefully uh, you enjoyed it a little bit. Of course, I'll do the demonstration of the product mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll now hand over to Raina Fink to do the product part. Yeah. Well, see, he helped me in many different subjects, different uh, projects for so many years. And then when we started, yeah, we fight in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You still yeah. remember the portable audio time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a crazy time. But anyway, now we become really good friends and then we can work really nice together. Okay, now. Right. Okay, thank you, thank you, Ken. This well, was this was of course the easy part, yeah. So he, uh, he always gives <laughs> <laughs> the challenging things to me. So now now it's all about product, and uh, as Ken was pointing out, I think not really strong enough. It's all about his uh, Ruby anniversary, and uh, yeah, we started already thinking about the project quite a while ago, as you can Im rem uh, imagine. And uh, maybe some of you also still recall that there was a KI Pearl for the 30th anniversary of Ken. And uh, yeah, that's just 10 years ago. And uh, yeah, we thought it's maybe not uh, a bad idea to keep uh, big parts of the com cosmetics the same and just show the progress uh, by a different sound character, by different maybe feature set as it is called today, but also by uh, yeah, a complete new technology in both products. So what I would like to do, maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, to just highlight some of the things we've done on these products. And uh, yeah, I don't want to go into too much details. There's of course many, many things we can talk about for, for hours if you like, but I don't want to do that. So at the end, uh, what I would like to do is first give you an insight on uh, the commercial concept of it. So uh, what we will do is we limit this to 1,000 sets, 1,000 amplifier, 1,000 CD players, if you like, and there will be 500 black, 500 gold, and it's already saying they will be numbered, even numbers are gold, hot numbers get the uh, uh, up on the black sets. It will look similar like this. So it's kind of numbering, as people know, maybe from um, artists numbering the uh, number of uh, prints, for example. Uh, Do you deliver the will we get presentation on uh, This will be uh, ready for download if okay. you are back in the office. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't yeah. need this. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
You did this before. <laughs> Not on the stage. <laughs> the things we do for love. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Just only one afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>